Dr. Scott screaming. He's 15. He's been on a hunger strike. He's been, he wouldn't eat lately. And, and I've been mean, checking on him all night because he said he was feeling good last night. And I woke up to get ready for the work this morning. And he's not breathing. Um, he ate yesterday, but he hasn't eaten. He's like, he's driving me crazy because he wouldn't eat hardly. And so he's really, he got really skinny and he won't eat. And I was just about to call the doctor this morning because he's just been horrible. On the 6th of July, 2022, Norton Shaw's emergency services rolled up to a tent to a non-responsive 15-year-old boy. Within minutes, emergency crews would pronounce Timothy Ferguson deceased. Tragically, Timothy had been deceased for several hours. His mother and older brother had attempted to resuscitate him, but it was too late. As this tragedy unfolded, the details of Timothy's life and death would begin to reveal he was a victim of the most horrific torture by the two people who attempted in vain to save his life, only to save their own fate. Now you said the last time you saw him was 5.30 this morning? Yeah. Did he say anything? He had fallen out of bed. At 5.30? Yeah. You sure it wasn't earlier? I mean, it's possible. I thought it was 5.30, but... I wasn't super awake. I heard a thump and I came down and he's kind of laying on his side, kind of like, what the heck? And, um, and I picked, I, uh, I, yeah, I reached out and he, he, I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm sorry. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, yeah. And I reached out and he pulled himself up and I asked him if he's okay. And I just asked if he hit his head. He said, no, I think I hit my, my, my knees on my chest. I think he couldn't, obviously he couldn't tell me how he fell. Um, oh my God. No, oh, I don't know what to do. Oh my God. He said it was okay. Pardon? Where does he sleep? Down there, right there in that room. The bed? Okay. Yeah. You see the pillow and the blanket and stuff? He sleeps on the top bunk? Yeah, it's a lot. This is Paul Ferguson, doing right. Timothy's older brother. He attempted to revive yeah, his brother. Yeah, it's almost like you're in a daze. Like you don't know what's real and what's not. Hey, have, have you been talking to him at all recently? I talked to him yesterday morning to get him up. I was did you, did you know that he was in this hunger strike? Did I tell you or not? I don't know if I did or not. Because he's, he's skin and bone. I know. And I just, how did he he's, he's really. Well, he, he, he doesn't communicate with him hardly at all. Like they say hi and they don't. Yeah. He's. One person is acting and one person is conflicted. Timothy Vagson was the youngest of four siblings and a big brother to his half-brother, Jay. Timothy was born to Shanda and Eric Ferguson. Shanda was born in Alabama in 1979. She grew up in Huntsville. After high school, she married Eric Ferguson and had a first child at the age of 21, a son, followed by son Paul in 2002, a daughter, then Timothy was born in August 2006. The couple divorced in 2012. Timothy and his siblings were subject to an investigation by CPS. An Oklahoma family court ruling saw Shonda relinquish her parental rights, agreed to leave the household, only have supervised visits for three hours once a month and pay for child support for the children. The four children were taken into custody by CPS, but then returned to the custody of their father and his new wife, who took the role of raising Shonda's children. Shonda would end up having over 18 different addresses before finding her way to Norton Shores, Michigan. Here, she would marry Adam van der Ark and give birth to his son in 2015. Seemingly, Shonda was able to wipe her slate clean and leave her past discretions behind. 
Shanda graduated from Cooley Law School with a Juris Doctor Law degree before attending Western Michigan University and achieving the second highest score in the bar exam, graduating with the highest honours. Shanda and Adam were living in a three-bedroomed house down the quiet Spearman Street in Norton Shores. They would keep to themselves. Shanda would train service dogs for extra income. She herself had her own service dog that she trained to detect blood sugar level drops, as Shanda claims to have reactive hypoglycemia, a condition in which blood sugar levels can drop after meals. Shanda's second eldest son, Paul Ferguson, would claim that after graduating high school, in Oklahoma, his father told him he needed to get a job and contribute financially to the household. Despite Paul getting two low-end jobs, giving his father half his wages, he would claim he was kicked out of the family home at the age of 18 and would stay with Shanda's brother before eventually reconnecting with his mother and moving in the, into the Van der Ark family home in May 2020. Then, in May 2021, Eric Ferguson contacts Shanda with an ultimatum that if she does not take in her son Timothy, then he's going to go into foster care. This, of course, was in breach of the order placed by the Oklahoma courts as Timothy was still a minor. Timothy's stepmother was struggling to cope with Timothy, citing her husband's constant absences from the family home as a contributing factor. Shanda agreed to take Timothy into her home. Timothy had developmental disabilities. According to his brother Paul, Timothy had slurred speech, issues with walking, a sensitivity to certain sounds, and was prone to having bathroom accidents. Although he was able to attend high school in Oklahoma and did well academically, according to Timothy's teachers, he had ADHD and autism, was a loving and friendly child, and had no speech or motor issues. Aside from Timothy's autism and ADHD diagnosis, he was reported to have bathroom accidents from time to time. After making the move from Oklahoma to Michigan to the Van der Ark house, Timothy's room was essentially a shared space between the two bedrooms assigned to Shanda's youngest son, G, and Paul on the lower level of the home, where they'd placed a cabin bed for him. With Adam Van der Ark at home while Shanda pursued her law career, Timothy appeared to be well cared for. Although Shanda failed to register Timothy with a doctor or a school, choosing to homeschool him like she was doing with her now seven-year-old son, G, and had stopped administering Timothy's ADHD medication that had zoned him out. Shanda's world would come crashing down in the beginning of January 2022. Her husband, Adam, who was born disabled, suffered a debilitating stroke. The Van der Ark home was on split levels. Adam had been able to manoeuvre himself between floors until the stroke robbed him of what limited mobility he had. After treatment in hospital, he had to move into his parents' home so they could help care for him. It was at this point that Shanda's struggles began. She no longer had anyone to watch the children while she followed her dream career. She'd been helping out as the clerk to the judge in Muskegon courts for experience. She'd find employment in a neighboring county court, but it wasn't the life Shanda had become accustomed to. She was now a single parent, working full time with two children to care for, mounting bills to pay. When Adam became sick, Shanda lost the financial support he'd provided. Whilst most people would seek help and support in the situation, Shanda chose not to, instead choosing to spiral down a dangerous path. It seems Shanda thought she could homeschool two children, work full-time, pursue her dream career of becoming a criminal appellant lawyer with just the help of a 20-year-old son, Paul, and a host of CCTV cameras. Shanda already had CCTV cameras in her home. She had gone to claim this was purely so Adam was able to keep an eye on the youngest child from upstairs. But Shanda began installing more cameras, each positioned in the lower level of the home. She would even place a motion detecting camera in the bathroom on the lower level. Then she began installing locks on the refrigerator, freezer and pantry. The reasoning was that Timothy was stealing food and needed to be restricted. It was alleged when he was in Oklahoma, he developed a trait of stealing and hoarding food. Whatever Shanda was going through mentally, she began to rain pure hell on Timothy. She began controlling every aspect of his life, his food intake, his movements within the home, and depriving him of any semblance of a dignified existence. Shanda enlisted Paul as a second in command to enforce her rules on Timothy, and Paul complied. Timothy no longer had free access to the house. His shared space room was now a closet with nothing but a tarp and a CCTV camera. 
Shonda would make him sleep in the closet with just an adult diaper, then, when the closet got soiled, make him take the tarp and scrub it clean. She then began limiting his food. He was only allowed bread or rice. But Shonda wasn't content with him just consuming bread. She would ensure it was covered in hot sauce, the hottest sauce you can buy. So Timothy would be in searing pain from hunger and searing pain from eating. He was allowed one minute bathroom breaks, two minutes if it was to defecate. His body weight was dropping at a rapid rate. Shanda would then cable tie his hands together. Then she purchased shackles to confine him. She would attach bicycle lock alarms to his body so if he moved it would let off a high pitched alarm, forcing him to stay motionless with his hands behind his head for hours. When Shanda was at work, she would constantly message Paul with commands to punish Timothy, while monitoring every move on the camera she installed. To such an extent was her obsessive behaviour that co-workers became frustrated because she was too distracted to be able to keep up with her workload. It was almost as if Shanda was living out some sick fantasy game. In her mind, Timothy was some kind of delinquent who needed to be punished. This couldn't have been further from the truth or reality. For the last six months of Timothy's life, he was beaten, starved, confined, given ice baths, forced to clean and do laps in the backyard, despite his body becoming nothing but skin and bone. Shanda would leave each morning to go to work as a clerk to judge to the judge, amongst people who were completely oblivious that she was torturing her own son, a son she should never been able to have unsupervised contact with. Paul would be home making sure G wasn't around whilst he inflicted the punishments on Timothy at his mother's behest. It seems Shanda had no close friends and no family contact apart from the in-laws who would have contact with their grandson G. Paul worked evening shifts at Applebee's. Everything was coordinated so that Shanda came home, she would take over and Paul would go to work. What is heartbreaking about this case is that nobody knew this was happening to Timothy. His other older siblings didn't want any contact with Shanda. Timothy never left the home. Shanda couldn't risk anyone seeing his emaciated frame. He was chained, doors locked. Timothy had no means of escape. Then the day would come when Timothy's body could take no more. Shanda would arrive home from work and force Timothy to take yet another ice bath. As he sat in the bath, hypothermia began to take its toll. Timothy's body had no body fat left. The starvation had forced his body to eat into the fat stores to survive. He was so weak that Shanda would have to physically drag him out the bath and into the closet with just an adult diaper. Even the warmth of July couldn't reverse the damage. Timothy couldn't even muster the strength to move. As Timothy lay gasping for breath as his body shut down, in one last act of evil, Shanda would clasp his mouth shut and call him a profanity before shutting the closet door and no doubt laying down in a warm, cosy bed. Timothy died with no love and no dignity. When Shanda came down the next morning, she would find Timothy's lifeless body, calling out to Paul to give him CPR, ensuring she dragged his body out of the closet and put clothes on him to hide his withered frame before calling 911, 18 minutes later. Shanda feigned distress for the benefit of emergency responders, claiming Timothy had done this to himself, that he'd refused to eat, but the very camera that she relied upon to watch Timothy in the closet held an SD card. That recorded her last interaction with Timothy, revealing the true horror she inflicted in the last hours of his life. The camera recorded Timothy taking his last breaths. Shanda was arrested and charged with first-degree felony child abuse just two days after Timothy's death. His mother, 43-year-old Shanda Vander Ark, appeared in court for the first time this afternoon on murder and child abuse charges. As prosecutors argued for the judge to deny her bond, they read the disturbing allegations. In the denial of food to the child, feeding the child nothing but bread and bread soaked in hot sauce, pouring hot sauce down the child's throat, and placing the child in an ice bath, which uh, we believe will be the explanation ultimately for why the child had suffered hypothermia, and that most notably happened the day before the child passed away. The judge ultimately denied her bond, leaving Vander Ark in a Muskegon County jail tonight. Yeah, we, they, I, saw, I saw on your phone that you had sent a, a couple pictures to your mom. Yes. Pretty skinny, and you said, you know, hey, he's nothing but skin. Yeah, I was, I was very concerned. It just... Uh, yeah, what do you think then? Maybe we'll be a good time to take him to the doctor or? 
Yeah, honestly, that probably would have been one too. I, just, I don't know. And then you sent a picture of like his legs that were just basically gone, right? So yeah, no wonder he can't stand or something along the lines. Yeah, of that. but the thing is, before yesterday, and I think the day before, he could walk. Yeah. You might need a little support every so often, like he put his hand against the wall or grabbed the rail of the stairs. But after a couple of seconds, he'd let go and be fine. Okay. It was never anything major. Really. Yeah. When was, like, the last time he was really, like, talking to you, like, able to have a conversation or at least try to have a conversation? Um, last time he actually talked was three days ago, but the day before, or the day after that, the day before yesterday, he could talk, a, he talked a small amount in the morning, but then he just sort of was making groans and moans, and it concerned me. I was... As my mother was driving me to work, I, I recommended that maybe we should take him to the hospital. Okay. I'm not sure if that ever happened or not. I, what did I she What did she say about that when you, when you made that recommendation? I I don't know. I think after that, I think that was like as I was getting out of the car and shutting the door. Yeah. So we're talking. So today's the seventh. Yesterday, the sixth. What day are we talking about the last thing was really kind of talking outside of the morning? Growing? The fifth. The fifth. He, he talked some in the morning. He was okay. responsive. Yeah. That much I know. What's the deal with the photograph in the bathtub of his face? Like zoomed in on his face. Uh, he, he, he had been taking a bath. Okay. And I went in there to check on him at one point and he was just kind of laying there. I'm like, bud, you okay? He didn't respond, but he was looking around. So... He, and he was breathing, I know that much. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you guys did it? Like, why? why? Like, what no, did he do? not exactly. What did he do on that day that he sent the photo that made you have to give him a cold bath? Um, I think it was that he not only peed, but also pooped. In bed. Oh. And my mother wasn't too happy because it absolutely reeked. Yeah. Um, when we talk about bed, I understand we've been to the house and we've been through all the messages. Yeah. Did, where did you sleep most of the nights in that closet? Yes. When did that kind of start happening? Um, or had he always been staying there? No, he hadn't always. Okay. But the thing was, the loft bed, if you've noticed, yeah. just screws and stuff, that was his doing. Okay. And we couldn't get it safely back. So, he's been sleeping in the closet? Yes. We made sure that it was cleaned. He had a mattress in there, but then he decided to rip off the uh, cover, like a sort of plastic cover we'd put on there to keep it from getting smelly and yeah. disgusting. Yeah. told you what to say. It's okay. She told you what to say. Because why? Did she tell you why? Does it look bad for you guys? It's not just that. We loved him. She... Does she, this, can I ask you this? Like, straight up? You keep saying love, love. Do you feel like this was love? That he's dead now because he couldn't eat food? Does that feel like love to you? No. He's dead because he couldn't eat. No. And, and I don't know anybody that thinks that's love. What I think's happening is your mom's convinced you that she's this perfect person. And she's asking you to do all these things that are literally killing your brother. I know she's not perfect. How is that love? How is love? How is love ice baths? How is love? How is love handcuffing and how is love restricting movement? And how is love hot sauce in the mouth and only eating bread? Like what if you're what if you only got to eat bread? How would you feel? What if you only got to eat bread with hot sauce? Would you eat? No. You're pretty skinny already. It wouldn't take you this, long. This is this is my natural weight. I have an overactive metabolism. But it wouldn't take you long to be very much skin and bones if all you got to eat was bread and hot sauce. Because how could you eat it? And how could you feel good about eating it? What was your mother's choice? Her choice was more punishment, less food. More punishment. The only food you get is bread. And the only bread you get sometimes is with the hottest hot sauce that we can find. That's all you get to eat. There's no way that you can look at yourself and think, that's okay. 
and that your mom's good for that. She was doing what's best for him. How could that be best for him? Why couldn't it be? Why couldn't it be a, a piece of chicken that's, that's cooked? Why couldn't he eat that? Why does it have to be bread with hot sauce? It's not about punishment. You need food to survive. You need food to live. He didn't get to live because of that. Because of what you guys did. And, and I'm sitting here talking to you because I think that way more of it has to do with your mom than you. I don't think that you're this bad person who was out here doing these things. But you're also still not telling me the whole truth about what happened that night. About the night that he ended up dead. That there's more to that story. I've told you everything that I have. I don't want to live a life where I regret the fact that I hid somehow, something. And I've told you everything I know. How do you feel about living a life where you hid that your brother wasn't eating? from society that you hid, that your brother was dying. How do you feel about that? I hate myself, okay? If I could take his place right now, if I could give him back his life, I'd do it in a dead gum heartbeat. Smack him in the face to see if he's faking it? I was trying to see what was going on, trying to see if he would even respond if what was going on with him. I was. Because to I'm you, scared. not the smartest person in the room, to you, you already know, this isn't okay. This is a dying person. This is your brother dying. <coughs> Ooh, sorry about that. This is your brother. And he's, he's almost dead. Another and, thing. And so she I kept him. setting him up. Yeah. And I would come back a little later and I would notice that he would, he actually had moved himself back down. I wasn't sure if it was intentional or if he was trying to clear up his airway, maybe. But, but just move it. Well, what is that supposed to mean? Well, he must be okay because he moved a little bit? That's where we're at? I wasn't He's sure. He's so that. far gone that you, you're like questioning if he moves a little bit, he must be okay? Come on. I wasn't no. sure. Where did that stuff come from? Where did that come from? Didn't your mother send you messages that said, I saw him move. I saw him. Did she send that to you? Yes. And what does that mean to her? That it's fake? Is this fake to you? No. Is your brother lying on the floor dead? Is that fake to you? No. You know who it didn't matter to at all? You know why I didn't see she had a single tear the whole day I was there? Your mom. Did you see her cry a real tear? Yes. I saw a whole bunch of fake. You know what my job is to see? Fake. You know what I saw a whole bunch of? Fake. Because at the end of the day, this, your brother gone, that's a problem for her that's gone. She never was trying to solve this problem. She was never trying to make him into this perfect person because she's smart enough to know that isn't going to happen. He's never going to be you. He's never going to, because he has too many problems. He's not going to be that. She's smart enough to know that. That's how we ended up here. The smartest woman in the room took advantage of you. And she asked you to do these things over and over and over again. And this is the woman you're sitting here saying she cares so much. Does she really though? She asked you to handcuff your brother, pour hot sauce in his mouth. She asked you to pour hot sauce on his Your mother asked you to do those things because she cares so much. She puts you in that spot. And now you're right in the middle of an investigation in which your brother died. And this is criminal. This is a crime. Did your brother deserve to die? No. Buddy, uh... Is it going? Or... Just says the line. Okay. Yeah, I got it, I got it. Uh... Hey, everybody. Uh, just figured I'd send a quick check for y'all, but, um... We're doing good right now. We, I just dozed off on the couch unintentionally. I forgot to give a quick check for today, but um, yeah. Oh, when I can't actually get in contact with you guys, I'll probably post a quick check like this. For those of you who aren't aware, um, my little brother 
has passed away, and my mother is currently in the custody of, well, I don't, I'm not sure if it's, it's, it's a lot to deal with, but right now we're doing good, we're, we're fine, but if I can't actually, like, Facebook you guys, like, with live, because I don't have my phone and I don't know how to access my stepfather's. I'll post a quick check to let you guys know everything that's going on. If you have any questions or anything, just comment them down below and I'll see if I can answer them in the next uh, quick check. Just keep supporting and pray that the two of us get through this. But, uh, I guess uh, I don't really have much that I can say right now. Uh, but, uh, in the comments, I'll leave you something if you guys want to uh, know what's going on. There we go. Well, I gotta go and get to back to bed. I'll probably post another quick check tomorrow. So. Doodles. Paul's interview with law enforcement would see him try to protect his mother before being confronted with the overwhelming evidence that would show they both had key roles in Timothy's death. Shanda had tried to delete messages from their phones and had disposed of a memory card from one of the cameras prior to getting arrested. Even Shanda's youngest son would tell detectives that he'd witnessed his mother and brother were hurting Timothy. The older brother of a 15-year-old boy with special needs who died last week has been charged with child abuse. 20-year-old Paul Ferguson was arraigned today on a charge of first-degree child abuse. He was arrested yesterday afternoon. Shanda would be arraigned in the very court she'd once worked in. Even with all her legal knowledge, she had the case go to trial, brazen enough to testify, but clearly delusional enough to believe she could sway a jury with wild claims that Timothy needed to be restrained and restricted because of his behaviour. You said the locks on the refrigerator were there because he got into the refrigerator, and if I heard your testimony correctly, he ate a pound of frozen hamburger? Yes, sir. That was and back. And a bag of chicken nuggets? A frozen bag of chicken nuggets, yes, sir. And, and frozen hamburger? Yes, sir. The hamburger was not frozen. It was refrigerated. But frozen chicken nuggets? Frozen chicken nuggets and raw bacon. And raw bacon? Yes, sir. Frozen raw bacon? No, it was in the refrigerator. The, the frozen stuff was the chicken nuggets? The chicken, chicken nuggets. That was the only frozen, yes, sir. Did you think he had an affinity for frozen food? I, I didn't know. The, frozen, the only thing he ate frozen was the chicken nuggets. Is that where you sent a text message to Paul while he was in the ice bath at 3.43 that afternoon and said, oh, okay, crazy thought. Tell him if he actually sits up by himself and stays sitting up, he will get some pizza rolls. Don't tell him it's only two, and I'm okay if they are frozen rather than cooked. Why'd you send that text message? I don't know. Don't remember that even either? No, sir. So you're not worried about him eating frozen pizza rolls if he sits up? If that's what it says. You've heard it read several times. Yes, You're not sir. doubting that's what it says, right? Yes, sir. Just another one of those memories that you just just gone from. You told Detective Pieski that long, long after the stroke happened in January, Timothy went on a hunger strike. That was a lie, wasn't it? Not long after. and No, that was not a lie. That was the truth. He went on a hunger strike. Yes, sir, he did. It, was, it wasn't immediately, but it was within a few days. And uh, a hunger strike is refusing to eat, right? Yes, sir. So he's refusing to eat food not long after your husband has a stroke, right? Yes, sir. Then you don't need to put locks on the refrigerator or freezer, do you? If he's refusing to eat. He, he stopped. He, he actually he started eating again. He started eating again, so then you decided he's been on a hunger strike, he's eating again, so now we better lock up the food. No, I did the, the locks to protect him because he could have he could have killed himself eating the chicken nuggets. I didn't put the locks on after he did the hamburger or the bacon, but the chicken nuggets, he could, it was raw chicken. Chicken nuggets are cooked, aren't they? They're pre-cooked. Are they? 
I didn't even think about that. <laughs> that you acknowledge that he was in zip cuffs. You, you, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but I don't think we clarified your final text message where you said, you know what? We will start cutting off the ends once they are tight so he can't do that. Is that one of the can't remember texts too? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, did, you didn't tell the detective about the warm bath, um, but you told him that you realized how skinny he was the night before and threatened to take him to the e ER if he didn't eat. That's not true, is it? No, sir. And you didn't make him a piece of toast and give it to him and make him eat it, did you? No, sir. I have no idea why I said that. I was, I was traumatized. I actually didn't come out of the first month I was in jail. I, it was... I wish uh, the Lydia that used to work for the Public Defender's Office visited me, and she, she said it was, it was pretty obvious that... I, I was under severe trauma. Mm -hmm. I didn't eat for my first month. This was this was while the, they were searching your house on July 6th while you were sitting in your house. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you thinking, oh, I better better tell him. Yeah, he looked a little skinny last night, and I thought I should take him to the ER and then make some toast with butter on it and watch him eat it, and he walked away. None of that happened, did it? No, I don't. I don't even remember that. But you had the presence of mind to lie to the officer at the time when he was investigating. Like I said, I was traumatized. I don't know. I don't remember this, sir. Um, he wouldn't come upstairs when she said goodnight. She walked down to the last couple of stairs and asked for a hug and a kiss. That didn't happen either, did it? I don't remember. I mean, I would assume not, but I don't remember. In fact, you're acknowledging that the, that video that shows you dragging him into a small room, looking like he does when he dies, calling him a dummy for breathing with his mouth open, is actually what you did to him the night before he died, right? If that's what it shows, I don't remember, sir. This is hours before he dies, right? Yes, sir. You look like that when you put him in the bathtub? Do we have a trash can? I did. I did. Would you like to remove? All right. Please rise. And I just felt I gagged that day too. It just wasn't as bad. Didn't throw up though. No, it wasn't as bad. So if there's video from that hearing that we had last week where you thumbed through the photographs, including the autopsy photos without vomiting, do you just not remember that as well? We didn't have the autopsy, we didn't have those photos over at our table, sir. You, it won't be on the video, I can promise you that. Well, then I'll return to my original question. Those three photographs depict your son hours after you supposedly put him in a warm bath. Did he look like that when you put him in the warm bath, but for the fact that he was alive? I did not look at him, sir. He was 15. I tried to give him his privacy. It may sound lame, but I, I intentionally look away. That's, that's why Paul did most of his baths, is because he's 15, and I didn't think that was appropriate. So you didn't put him in the bathtub? No, he was already in the tub. I just did, looked. Did you get him out of the tub? Um, I don't remember. I think, I think so later that night. I would assume so. Later that night? How long was he in the tub? Well, night to me is any time after work, so. Okay. How long was he in the tub? I don't, I mean, I don't think it was long after I got home, but I don't know. And again, you didn't tell the police officers this when they talked to you about what had happened the night before, did you? I, I don't remember. Apparently, I didn't. Well, so you don't remember what you told the police officers? I remember part of it, but, I mean, I'm, I, if you say I didn't tell them, then I'm... I trust your word there. If you told the police officers that you noticed he was skinny, so you made him some bread and put some butter on it and watched him eat three quarters of it and then sent him to bed, is that, does that refresh your recollection about what you told the officers? I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I don't remember saying it, but... So you don't remember saying those things to the police officer? No, sir. And those things clearly didn't happen, did they? No, sir. How did he get into his room that night? I don't remember, sir. Last page of the text messages. 
You can go ahead and read that very top text message, please. Please set your alarm for 6 a.m. I ended up dragging him back to a small room because I wasn't going to risk him having access to the tub or other things overnight. He's still trying to be stupid, but I will tell you more tomorrow while I take you to work, describing how many different ways I prove that he's still faking. He's still doing it, though. It's beyond ridiculous. <coughs> I ended up dragging him back to his small room because I wasn't going to risk him having access to the tub or other things overnight. Plan was for him to sleep in the bathroom, wasn't it? I don't remember, sir. I mean, I know that if in the text message, but if that's what the text message says. Okay. And you had to drag him back to the small room. Again, the small room being the closet, right? Yes, sir. Supposedly that he wanted to sleep in. Yes, sir. But you had to drag him there. Why was that? Well, Dragging, I mean, that could be anywhere from grabbing hold of an arm and because someone's not being cooperative, that's, that, that can be a range of things, sir, so I don't know what I was referring to there. You've seen the video, haven't you? No, sir. I haven't seen any videos. Do you need your, do you need your memory refreshed about him getting back in the small room that night? No, sir. I mean, like I said, I'll take the, I just, I don't remember actually doing it. Did you physically pull him into the room that night? Yes, sir. I mean... And did you, set, did you push him down onto the ground so that he was laying and facing the camera? If that's what it shows, then yes, sir. And did you put, position his face towards the camera? If that's what it shows, I... And did you tell him that he owes you the biggest apology on the face of the earth and then maybe he can get out to go to the bathroom? If that's what it shows, sir, I... I don't remember. And did you return a little while later because he had rolled over away from the camera so that you couldn't see him on camera? If that's what it shows. I don't and, remember any of this. And did you tell him you don't need to open your mouth every time you breathe, dummy, and then hold his mouth shut? I don't know what I said, sir. I mean, I'll take your word for that's what the video Oh, you don't have to take my word for it. Let's play the video for it. Sir, that's not necessary. If that's what you're saying it shows. I believe you. I'm not. So you're acknowledging that the night before Timothy died, hours before he died, you dragged him, looking like that, back into his small room, positioned him in front of a camera, told him he owed you an apology, then came back later because he rolled over away from the camera and held his mouth closed and said, see, you don't have to open your mouth when you breathe, dummy? You're acknowledging you did those things. If that's what the camera shows, yes, sir. You didn't put him in a warm bath that night, did you? Yes, sir, I did. But you have to drag him away from it? If that's what it says, I don't... I know that he, I, I know he had a hoodie on. Paul would testify against his mother. He would pleaded guilty to the charges of first-degree felony child abuse on Lake Shanda. Although Paul knew his actions were wrong and he has taken culpability for his role, it does appear that Paul has some form of learning difficulty. When interviewed by det detectives, it was apparent that Shanda had a very strong influence over him. Me too. Yes. Now, around the uh, shortly after the time of the stroke, um, did there come a point in time where you became involved in having to administer some discipline to your younger brother, to Timothy? Yes. Um, we'll talk about some specifics, but uh, we've already had some text messages read and and you've had an opportunity to kind of hear about some of those text messages throughout this, right? Yes, sir. And you sent text messages back and forth between yourself and your mother. Um, and we had those text messages from January through the time of your brother's death in July of 2022. Was that your understanding? Yes, sir. The, at, at some point in time in February, there's a discussion fairly early in those text messages about um, blocking Timothy's access to food. Can you describe what was happening at that time and how he was restricted from getting access to food? Um, he was sneaking food that was not necessary at that time and it was solved by placing locks on the fridge, freezer, and pantry. When you say he was sneaking food that wasn't necessary, who would make that determination that it wasn't necessary? Shonda. The, uh, and what, what type of food are we talking about that he would sneak that wasn't necessary? Sweets or anything he could really get his hands on. 
so as early as February, there was restriction. The, the locks were going on the freezer and the refrigerator, and you said there was also some type of lock on the pantry. Is that right? Yes, sir. Um, and we've heard a text exchange, but at some point a little bit later, as, as things are progressing into April, was there a time where Timothy was doing something to get the locks off of the pantry door? He was pulling them off by hand. And what were you instructed to do as a result of him pulling the pantry door locks off? Let me ask you this way: Was were, were you were you given some instruction to replace that lock? Yes. And who gave you that instruction? Shonda. <coughs> At the time that he came to live with you, was he supposed to be taking some medication? Yes. And did that? Did he stop taking his medication? Yes. Why did he stop taking his medication? Um. I'm Could you please reiterate? Yeah, who, I guess the better way of saying it is who made the decision for him to stop taking his medication? Shonda. As far as you know, from the time that Timothy came to live with you in May of 2021 in Norton Shores to the time of his death, did you ever see Timothy go to, to a doctor? No. Did Timothy go to school? Not public, no. How was he schooled? Home. When we say homeschooled, what would that entail? Um, at first, it was assignments on a tablet, and then my mother restricted it to where she would print out the assignments, and he would sit downstairs and do them. Um, did the food, when did the food restriction on Timothy start with the locks going on in the refrigerator and the freezer and the pantry and things of that nature? When, when did that actually begin? Sometime in February. Um, there's been some testimony already about Timothy going on a hunger strike at, around the time of Adam's stroke. To your knowledge, did <coughs> Timothy ever go on a hunger strike when Adam had his stroke? No, sir. There's also a reference to him going on another hunger strike about two weeks before he passed away. Did, <coughs> excuse me, did that happen? No, sir. The small room that you've described, at some point in time there was a, uh, a, a tart placed in there, is that right? Yes, sir. And what was the reason there was a tart placed in that room? Due to Timothy's bladder problem, Shonda didn't want him urinating on the floor. We've seen a lot of text messages and references to hot sauce and hot sauce re retrieved from the home. Um, at some point in time, did you have were, were you asked to start feeding him bread with hot sauce on it? Yes. And who asked you to do that? Shonda. Um, why were you giving him bread with hot sauce on it? Um, because he was supposedly misbehaving. And how would you, I mean, describe to the jury what you would do to do that and to make him eat the bread with hot sauce? Um, I would put it on bread, have him stand in the kitchen area near the back door and watch him eat until he finished. I know this is difficult for you, Paul, and you and I have had a number of conversations about this matter, um, but I need you to look at a text message that you sent to your mother. It's got a photo that you took of your brother. You remember sending that text message? Yes, sir. For the record, this is People's 36A. It's been previously shown to the jury. Um, who took that photo of your brother? Me. And you sent it to your mother? Yes, sir. Why did you send it to your mother? Because I was concerned with how thin he was. And that photo was taken on, um, do you remember what the date was? Not the exact, no. If, if your phone indicated it was June 13th, you'd have no reason to dispute that? No, sir. Um, and you just became, again, the reason you sent it to your mother was why? Because I was concerned about how thin he was. And you remember what your mother told you to give him after she, you sent her that photograph? Bread. And then is there a reference to bread and some peanut butter? Yes. The So at that point he's your brother's very skinny, right? Was he eating regular meals at that point? No. Were you still administering the hot sauce on the bread as a form of punishment for him at 
during that time period? Yes. And did that continue all the way up until the time of his death? Yes. Did he ever eat any normal type of meal leading up to his death after you took that photo and sent it to your mother? Um, that day I made him an actual real meal, some, an actual peanut butter and jelly sandwich, as well as scrambled some eggs and put cheese in them. Did you tell your mother you'd made that meal for him? No, sir. Why not? Because I didn't want her to be upset with me. If you know, do you know how much time passed from the time that you first became aware he wasn't breathing until 911 was called? 18 minutes. And during that 18 minutes, was there, did you tell your, your mother or ask your mother if you were going to call 911? Yes, sir. Do you remember what she said? No. She said no. Sorry, that was my bad. I'm sorry. Good. Let's clarify that. Do you, do you remember what your mother said when you asked her if we should call 911? She said no. So you didn't call 911 at that time? No. Um, during that time period, uh, what were you doing? I was attempting to resuscitate, though it was too late. At the time when he came out of the, the small room, how did he get out of the small room at that point? How did his body actually come out of the small room? He was removed. By who? Uh, Sh Shonda, and I believe I helped a bit. What was he wearing when he came out of the room? Nothing but an adult diaper. At some point, did you put clothes on him? Yes. Who, who put the clothes on him? Um, both me and Shonda, per Shonda's... Uh, request, order, however you'd like to phrase it. So we, before he was wearing the diaper, and but you put the clothes on him while he's unresponsive outside of the small room? Yes. And what, do you remember what clothes you put on him? Um, a hoodie, a pair of my jeans, and Shonda had me remove my belt and put it on him. Did she tell you why she wanted you to take the belt off and put it on? Because the pants were too big. It does appear that Timothy actually passes away while in view of that camera. Yes, uh, it appears that way to me. Shanda failed to attend the last day of trial. She told jail staff she wanted to People hurt herself. State of Michigan versus Shanda Van Ark, count one, charging open murder involving the death of Timothy Ferguson. We find her guilty of first degree felony murder. Count two, first degree child abuse. We find her Guilty of first-degree child abuse. Shanda's academic intelligence ultimately became her downfall. Tessie finds she had no memory of the hideous act she subjected Timothy to, but the evidence was overwhelming. Shanda refused to accept any responsibility or show remorse for her actions. I am Timothy's oldest brother, and unfortunately the old, oldest child of Shonda Vanderark. I live with my wife 900 miles from here, and in July of 2022, I was working 60-hour work weeks trying to build a career when I received a phone call that I never thought I would get. My baby brother Timothy was gone. For two days, I reeled with no explanation until I was informed that our own mother was in jail for his murder. Somehow, making an entirely unexpected and deeply awful situation worse, I thought that things were different than when I was younger. I'm Millie. I'm Timothy's youngest older sister. I'm two years older than him. One of my earliest memories I have was being taken away from my parents by CPS. My two older brothers rode in a car ahead of us and me and Timothy rode together in the second car. And in every picture we have as a family, Timothy was always right by my side. We were the two youngest, the two smallest. We were the two that sat in the middle in the backseat car rides with the two small car. The last two to get hand-me-downs, the two that never had to worry about not getting homework help from an older si sibling. He was always two years behind me, so every time I got to the next level in school, that's how many years I had to wait for him to follow along. When I was in eighth grade, he was in sixth, and there was a student in my science class that started talking about him, trying to start rumors. I stood up right as class was starting, as people were quieting down, and I shouted at him to never talk about my little brother. People could say whatever they wanted about me, I didn't care, but not about him. 
and never about him, because I was his big sister. It was my job to protect him. I like to say I don't regret things in my life, that every mistake I've made has made me who I am today, but when Timothy died, I couldn't stop regretting. I regret not hugging him more and teasing him so much instead of telling him that I loved him every once in a while. I regret not putting aside my differences with Shonda and Paul just to check in on him. I regret not dancing with him the last time I saw him at our brother's wedding. These are the things that I can't remedy now. There's no fixing what's been done. No way to redo it all over again. And that's my regret, that I couldn't protect him when he needed me most. Timothy was so smart. He could take anything apart with any tools or none at all. He had trouble focusing, but when he did, he was just as smart as the rest of his class. He made people angry, yes, but then he would look at you with those big baby blue eyes and you could never stay mad at him. You know, Mr. Johnson makes the same argument today that he made at the trial uh, that, that this was just negligence. This was her not understanding what was going on. She was really trying to do the punishment. Uh, she was trying to be a good parent and she just didn't realize that Timothy was in such a horrible condition. And uh, I find myself, I found myself, uh, especially during closing argument, quite frankly, finding myself almost believing that. And uh, afterwards, I, after the trial, uh, I sat in my car after leaving that day, trying to understand, uh, you know, why I could feel that way. And what I realized is that I wanted to feel that way because I didn't want to accept the reality of the situation here. And the reality of the situation here is that this person, Ms. Vander Ark, you intentionally engaged in these acts. This wasn't negligence, this is not understanding uh, why, but you intentionally did this with a goal. And uh, I think Mr. Johnson's correct. I don't believe there was an intent to kill here because you would have lost the very thing that you wanted to torture. Without him, you have no one to torture, except maybe the younger children. So I don't believe you intended to kill him. I, I think you intended to continue on torturing him uh, for as long as you possibly could. The why, I don't know. But all the information that I have in front of me, and I sat down, I really thought about this, and I looked over my notes from the trial, demonstrate that this wasn't negligence. This wasn't you not understanding what was going on. You look through, I, I read through every single text message of the exhibit, 2,000 plus pages to try to understand what the heck was going through your mind. And what became entirely clear to me is that you knew exactly what you were doing. Immediately afterwards, when police arrive at the home, you you immediately can, you know concoct this lie about he's been on a hunger strike. He's you know he was in the bed and I checked on him and I gave him some food and all this stuff. You got Paul involved in it. Uh, you know at one point in time, uh, you know you're you're put, you know put baggy clothes on him. Um, you know put clothes on him to make sure you know to make sure, I guess, that he, he looks like he was actually wearing them, that he was hiding his his, uh, his poor condition. Even though you already received text messages, you know, weeks earlier of how bad he looked. Uh, you know, you, you testified yourself how highly intelligent you were. In fact, that's the only thing that uh, you testified to that I think was actually true. You were quite proud of that, boastingly, boasting how intelligent you were. Uh, and not only that, but your actions in hiding this child. You, you, you hid him from uh, his grandparents. Uh, you made sure that uh, your other son, G, or, or little man, as you call him, didn't see him. You know, those text messages talk about not wanting uh, anyone to see him. You know, I want to see him in that condition. Uh, you made sure that the garage was closed. When, he was, when you sent him out, there was no pants on to clean out the garage. I don't want to believe it because 
I don't understand. I can't wrap my mind. I've been trying now for this entire case to wrap my mind about how somebody could do something so horrific, not only to another human being, but to their own child. As to count one, uh, felony murder. It's a sentence of the court. You serve a term within the Michigan Department of Corrections for the rest of your natural life without parole. Again, there's credit for 575 days that you've already served. There's a six to $8 state cost. Uh, the crime victim assessment fee has already been assessed and the court is gonna assess a $450 public defender fee. Ms. Vander, you have a right to file an application, excuse me, you have a right to file an appeal. Request for, this, if you are unable to afford an attorney, one will be appointed to a public expense. Request for the assistance of a lawyer must be made within 42 days from today's date. Clerk is handing you a form that you must complete. Return to the court in that 42 days. Mr. Roberts. Judge, just briefly, I believe you did indicate you would order that five dollars the judge went beyond the sentencing guidelines to ensure that Shonda remains behind bars for the rest of her life without the possibility of parole. Of course, she will most likely lodge an appeal. Following sentencing, Shonda's parental rights to her youngest son, G, were removed, ensuring that he will have no obligation to visit or have contact with Shonda in jail. Paul Ferguson is yet to be sentenced for his role in Timothy's abuse. In the state of Michigan, the maximum penalty for first-degree felony child abuse is life imprisonment. It's so difficult to understand how Timothy was able to be subject to such abuse and no one intervened or noticed. Shanda never saw any kind of treatment for Timothy, never attempted to reach out for support. It's unfathomable that she wasn't aware that her son was dying at her hands and chose that path. Psychologists refer to a term called the Cinderella phenomenon. This is when an abusive parent singles out one child to abuse. There is no definitive reason why this occurs, but psychologists have found that several factors can cause a parent to become an abuser. The most noted is redirected anger. In this case, it was clear Shanda was heavily impacted by Adam leaving the home. Other factors can include parents who themselves have been abused. Shanda claims she was a victim of abuse by both her father and then stepfather. With the Cinderella phenomenon, the victim can have a resemblance or exhibit traits to the abuser's past abuser. Timothy's own disabilities could also have acted as a trigger to Shanda and re resulted in directing anger towards him. But the most damning factor was Shanda involving Paul with the abuse and his willingness to cooperate. Shanda was able to command him to inflict abuse, encourage him to do so and then praise him. She twisted his sense of morality completely to justify what she was doing to Timothy. They developed a peculiar relationship where Paul clearly enjoyed the constant back and forth communications with his mother. It's utterly heartbreaking to even contemplate what Timothy endured those last months of his life, but what the court couldn't disclose was that Timothy's entire life had been troubled. From elementary school to high school, teachers had made multiple reports to CPS because Timothy would arrive at school in dirty clothes, be unkempt and smelly. His teachers would let him shower and launder his clothes. On Fridays, he'd put food in his bag for the weekend. They were concerned that Timothy was being over-medicated with his ADHD medication to zone him out. Teachers were made aware that allegations were made that Timothy was being S-abused by a sibling. Timothy was prone to bathroom accidents. His psychologist suggested that this was trauma-related. One teacher felt that Timothy loved school so much because it was a safe space for him. His stepmom had expressed to the school that he had issues with stealing and hoarding food, and the teachers had recommended counselling, but she declined. They noticed he never had issues with food when at school and maintained a healthy weight. Timothy's family members would later tell investigators that Paul was particularly mean towards Timothy when they lived together in Oklahoma and relished in tormenting him. Timothy was institutionalised for a period of time because he experienced an extreme depressive episode. Even this wasn't enough to alert authorities he was not in a good home environment. Whilst Timothy clearly wasn't getting the nurturing support he needed, teachers noted they didn't think he was being physically abused whilst in Oklahoma. Despite the numerous and ongoing reports from his teachers concerned about his welfare, he remained with his father and his stepmom heavily medicated with ADHD medication. In just over 12 months of living with Shonda, Timothy would be starved and tortured to death and his brother in jail. 
You can't help but wonder if the reason why Timothy was never registered with the school or physician was shunned a sly attempt to prevent authorities taking an interest. If ever there was a case where a parent's rights being relinquished was justified, this was that case. On the 8th of June 2021, Paul recorded and uploaded this to Facebook. You can hear Timothy's voice and notice how abrupt Paul is being with him. No, I don't think it was. Nope, because this is bad. Who are you adding? Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Also, I'm live streaming my little brother's face. Also, I'm live streaming my little brother's first baseball game on Facebook if you want to watch. Waiting for show up and, well, not show up, but you know. Stop. Timothy, don't, please. Sorry. No, I'm live streaming it to Facebook. Nope. Paul posted this video of Timothy in July 2021. This video was posted in September of 21 and you can see Timothy sat in the background. Shanda attended the wedding of her oldest son in October 2021. Timothy was in attendance, but not pictured. Gemini is fine. He just can no longer work as my service dog. And it became apparent immediately that he was not handling me having to leave him for work well at all. So I rehomed him today with a co-worker that absolutely does him one positive. Shanda created a GoFundMe to raise funds to purchase a new service dog. She raised $945. She posted this on Christmas Eve. Aldous is married out of state, but almost nothing for Christmas for the other three this year. Sad face. Paul posted this on the 25th of December 2021. At first I was confused why I had so few gifts, but now I know why. With a message and you're going to Disney World. On the 28th of December 2021, Shanda posts, Hi you all, my name is Sharma and I arrived home with my new girl a few minutes ago. She spent the trip back from picking me up telling me about the important job I'm going to learn to do for her. Super excited about that and well excited about lots right now. On May the 14th, 2022, Shanda posted a picture of her husband with the message, groceries for my boys and me please, with a cash app handle. In April 2022, Paul posted this to his social media, celebrating his birthday, but it appears that Timothy isn't present. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Oh, oh my gosh, it's frustrating. <laughs> It might be. Whoa! Whoa, that was a scary. Thing. Oh boy, back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. Whoa! Hello. I think that's Isn't that cool? It'd be easy to describe Shanda as a sociopath or narcissist to justify her actions or blame an abusive childhood. But it appears Shanda just needed to be in control of her world and everyone in it. No doubt, somewhere in her past, an event occurred that triggered superiority complex. Sadly, I suspect when Timothy moved in with her, she wasn't able to control him like she could Paul and G. She took Timothy's behavioural traits as acts of defiance, instead of seeing them as part of his diagnosis, as part of who he was. 
In a strange parallel, the service dog she owned gave a small clue to this theory that she needed to have control, and control gave her power. Her pathway to become a lawyer was another facet of being in charge. As Timothy became weaker, she relished in that. This is why Adam's stroke was such a trigger, a situation that she couldn't control. The house was a mess, all indicates that she was spiralling because life wasn't going the way she wanted it to. This is one of those cases that is truly heartbreaking. You cannot bear to imagine what Timothy's life was like, nor the suffering and pain he endured. He needed love and support, but ultimately both parents failed him. Hey, that makes it look bad. You see your ribs on camera and you are not skinny. I mean, you're not heavy, but you're just you're big boy. He eats so much. Yeah, good boy. All right, well, y'all take care. I will quit rambling now. <laughs> yes, I know. You just want to, he's going to climb further in my lap. The minute I turn this video off, he's going to climb all the way up into my lap in this chair. Just watch. Oh, well. See y'all soon. <laughs> Bye. Swear I won't forget this, why do I regret this? In my mind reckless, thoughts are feeling endless Sitting up I'm breathless, anxiety's infectious I feel so defenseless, betrayed and embarrassed I hate being open, I hate being broken I feel like an ocean filled up with emotion Anger ain't a potion, rub it on like lotion I can feel it soaking, reopen, the scars have awoken I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go